I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to our first for this semester uh, small talks about big data. Uh, we have a, a couple of more scheduled for the remainder of the semester. But uh, this is an excellent opportunity to kind of uh, get a first-hand introduction to uh, some of the more relevant uh, topics and activities surrounding big data and how it's being used to, uh, to manage the uh, uh, business environment that we all are part of and, and are uh, participating in. This uh, evening, we have a presentation on data visualization, which was going to be given by uh, Dr. Morbido. And uh, I'd like to, uh, again, welcome you all to, to, the, uh, uh, to the presentation. Why consider data visualization in the first place? Okay. It's because the human mind and our visual system can process graphical images and see patterns that we cannot see in the underlying data. Okay. So just think of Excel. You can see patterns along the X and Y axis that you cannot see if you were looking at a simple listing in a database table. Also, the visualization elicits questions. It elicits curiosity, it elic elicits further exploration in a way that the data itself cannot. So let's take a look at a few popular visualizations that you may have seen before and see why this is true. Now we're gonna make, I'm gonna mention this person's name several times. Today his name is Edward Tufte, famous professor from Yale University. So I know it's difficult for you to see this particular image but this concerns the Challenger space shuttle disaster. And even though we're talking about big data, meaning lots of rich data and lots of um, large volumes of data, here we have relatively few data points only because there aren't that many launches of space shuttles. However, even here, if you look carefully at the temperatures here, at the high temperatures, here we have along the y-axis, we have O-ring damage, and along the x-axis, we have the temperature. So you notice that the temperature, when the temperature is fairly high, there's no damage to the O-ring. But as the temperature gets cooler, you notice the O-ring increasingly becomes damaged. Until way up here, it's very damaged. At, on the day of the launch, the temperature was down here. So the whole O-ring, uh, there, is, there is no damage index because it failed completely. And the space shuttle, of course, exploded. So this is an example of how a little visualization could have benefited the decision making involved in whether to launch or not. Now, I think this is the uh, cover of his book, uh, one of his many books, and he also mentions here John Snow. This is a well-known visualization published more than 100 years ago concerning the cholera epidemic in London, and he was able to do a statistical analysis, and by overlaying the analysis on a map of London, he was able to identify the source of the infection. We also have this idea of scientific visualization, which concerns more the three-dimensional aspects of visualization. So I think we've all seen this image here of the Porsche in the lower left-hand corner moving around. <laughs> and also the molecule on, on the uh, right side also rotating. So uh, when we go to three-dimensional visualization, we could bring in the notion of simulation and animation. Now, one of the most popular and one of my favorite visualizations is this one over here in the middle, which I blew up for you. This is uh, Charles Joseph Menard's representation of Napoleon's march into Russia. So this was created 
in see November 1869. The march itself was from 1812 to 1813. Now you notice the, the width here indicates the size of the army. And as the army moves into, with some, some branches over here, as the army moves into Russia, you notice that the, the band gets more and more narrow. Okay? So the visualization tells us a lot just by looking at it. Okay? And the, the dark line shows his retreat. So you, you notice the line keeps on getting more and more narrow. Okay? So finally at the end, there's almost no one left. Okay? And over here, we can map it to the temperature. So there's a lot of information here, and it actually looks nice, but it helps to explain exactly what is going on. And we could even visualize from this visualization what's going on out in the field. On the other hand, I say don't let this happen to you. This is a, an image that I use not in my talk on visualization in my courses on visualization, but rather in my course on data modeling. When, when I'm about to speak on abstraction, I show this as an example of someone not using abstraction and cluttering up the picture. Okay? So this was what was presented to General Petraeus when he took over command of Afghanistan. And after it was presented to him, he couldn't understand it. Okay? And, and the reason is that there's too much information here. So in effect, nothing is being communicated. Okay? So we're going to see this throughout uh, our, our lecture today. We want to have something that looks very rich like this, but also something that is understandable. Okay. Now, when we go into a business environment, what do we actually see? Do we see images that look like Napoleon's march into Russia? We don't. Instead, we see something like a pie chart. Okay. So now we need to distinguish our visualizations. Okay. So we have two broad categories of visualization. The first is generally called the data visualization. This will be our pie chart. I'll use the term pie chart as a metaphor okay, to include traditional business graphics like pie charts, bar charts, line graphs. Okay. These are based on algorithms. So every pie chart looks like every other pie chart. The only thing that's different is the size of the pie wedges and their number. Otherwise, there's no difference. Okay. We can easily regenerate these visualizations with new data. They're not particularly appealing, but they're relatively data rich, meaning we can handle huge volumes of data, even though the image looks very simple. In contrast, what I just showed you are not what is generally called the data visualization, but it's really more like graphic design, where it's manually drawn and is specific to the data at hand. Not very data rich, but actually it's aesthetically pleasing. Now in business intelligence, we're gonna to try to exploit both images, okay? So just a brief review, when we discuss data visualization, we're usually thinking about the pie chart, okay? When we are talking about an information graphic or graphic design, we're talking about something that looks much more complex, but more specific to the data at hand, okay? And we're gonna use both in business intelligence. Now, we also want to structure our visualization, if possible, to reveal something about the underlying data. Okay. So the Napoleon's march into Russia, that image, that graphic, 
told us something about the underlying data. The same is true with the periodic table of elements, which has been called one of the most elegant visualizations. Okay. It organizes data by atomic number, but based on where it makes its bends in both columns and, and rows, it tells us whether we're looking at acids or alkaloids or metals and so on and so forth. So it tells us something about the data. The image itself tells us something about the data. But that's more so with the information graphic, not so much with the pie chart. Now, businesses can also use information graphics, and a good example would be the balanced scorecard, which is a traditional way of looking at the organization in terms of layered models and in terms of strategy. Okay. So we could design a visualization. Well, this is the visualization. And we could design a, a graphic that implements this out in the field. And in fact, this is being done. Okay. But here we have to be a little bit careful because we're getting dangerously close to that Afghanistan idea because this looks like a busy picture. We're going to have to make some decisions before we try to implement the balanced scorecard. The way an organization would use this is that they would actually instantiate this model for their organization. They would determine, for example, whether or not they are achieving, say, customer intimacy versus product leadership, and in so doing, they will hide certain parts of this picture and in order to reveal what they're interested in. This is what we call abstraction. So in this way, we can make the picture much more simple. Okay. Exactly what the people in Afghanistan did not do. On the other hand, when we go into the business world and we see a business intelligence display, what we actually see is something like this. We see a visualization, our pie chart, but not by itself. We see it with a collection of other visualizations, often of different types. We see line charts, we see bar charts, we see tables, pie charts, maps, all sorts of things on the same picture, on the same display. This is more or less becoming a business intelligence standard. The display on the right is sometimes called the dashboard. Okay? Now, I'm not that fond of it for a variety of reasons, as we'll see today. Okay? But we want to make certain that we could distinguish between a visualization, as shown on the left, and a display which is shown on the right. The display typically contains many visualizations in the same display, in the same picture. So let's come up with an approach to actually designing our visualizations and displays in the field. So essentially, what I did is I took the, what we need to consider when designing a visualization and what we need to consider when designing a display, and I kind of fused it together and we need to integrate, of course, with higher level organizational strategies and visualization strategies. Okay. So we have a nice model here of how we're going to actually design visualizations and displays. So I want to go through each of these three areas here. We have goals and strategies on top, data visualization on the left, and business intelligence displays on the right. Okay. So for goals and strategies, we have a variety or a various levels of abstraction. Okay? We have the organization's general philosophy, its culture, its business processes, and we go down through looking at design factors, our goals, and I would like to explore a little bit today the third column, the visualization strategies whether they're exploratory, explanatory, or a hybrid. So exploratory visualization means we have lots of data, but we don't know what the data tells us. So we have to discover the story in the data. Explanatory means that we already know the story, 
and now we're trying to communicate the story. That has been typically what most people think of visualization. Today we have a third form that really comes from business intelligence. It's called here a hybrid exploration explanation. And look at what these three sub bullets say. Interactive via graphical interface that lets the reader select and constrain certain parameters, thereby letting the reader discover the insights that they may have to offer. There's a certain amount of freedom to discover, but it's usually not totally raw, meaning that the data has already been distilled and designed to some degree. Okay. In my courses on business intelligence, this is exactly the definition of online analytical processing, or OLAP. Okay. It's our standard design technique. Let's take a look at explanation. Here we have three types also. Most are informative. That means we're trying to have a neutral presentation of the information. Next is persuasive, where we're trying to convince the reader of something. Visual art is the graphic design. Okay? And here, the weak point of visual art, as we saw, is that someone may need to explain it to you, what it actually means. It's not self-explanatory the way uh, data visualization is, the way our pie chart is, okay? Now, since we have a presidential debate tonight, let's put a little political wrinkle in this. We have two examples of persuasive visualizations, which you cannot see, okay? Because it's too blurry. I understand that. But what I wanted to show you is that these visual visualizations look very different, don't they? Okay. This is the Republican Party's perspective of the health care law, what's generally called Obamacare. This is the Democratic Party's perspective of the same law. Okay. They're trying to persuade you of something. Okay. The Republicans are trying to tell you that this is way too complicated. Okay. And the Democrats are saying it's not so complicated. In fact, it's almost simple. <laughs> okay. So now let's move to the lower left of our model, the visualization itself. Here we have four design parameters, and these are designed jointly. Okay. We have the data itself, the visualization encodings, and encoding means our decision to you say color, or a, or a thick line, or a thin line, or a solid line, or a dotted line. Okay. Our format, meaning whether we're going to use a line chart or a pie chart, and the navigation strategy, how we're going to navigate through the data, through the visualization. Okay. And again, all four of these are designed jointly. So we have a slide on each of these, okay? So for the data scales, we have quantitative data, of course, distinct numerical values. We have the categorical scale, of which there are three common types. A nominal scale, which are non-quantitative categories with no particular ordering or connection, as in, say, the names of departments in a company or the names of schools here at Stevens. Then we have an ordinal scale, which is also non-quantitative, but there's a little bit more of a connection between the categories. Okay. So we can have, for example, uh, we could take those same departments in a nominal scale and sort them by expenses. Okay. So that would be an, or an example of an ordinal scale. We could sort our salespeople by high performance versus moderate performance versus low level performance, high, medium, low. Very, very common, okay? We can divide students up into quintiles, which is often done with SAT examinations, okay? And then we have an interval scale, continuous range of quantitative values, 
but divide it up equally, as in months. Also, as we, as the students, I see some students from my business intelligence class, as we often do in BI, uh, we break up, say, salary into bands. So I don't have to track you when your salary goes up by $1. Okay, instead I'm tracking bands of salary, say $10,000 bands, or I'm tracking bands of age categories, five years, five-year bands. Okay, so this would be an example of an interval scale. The relational scale shows data with more complex associations as we find in data modeling. Okay, where we consider things like functional dependencies in the data. Now for the visual encodings, how do we know if we should select a, a solid line or a dashed line? Okay. So there are several factors to take into account. The first is whether the encoding has a natural ordering or not. Okay. By natural ordering, we, we mean the unintentional ordering or assignment of ranking of different values of the property. So that position has a natural ordering. Okay. We assume that what appears in the top left is more important than what appears in the lower right. Line thickness has a natural ordering. ordering. The thicker line is considered more important than the thinner line. But line style, <laughs> like whether it's solid, solid or dotted, does not. Length does. The second factor is concerns the number of distinct values that the encoding can maintain in the same display so that we can differentiate a medium number of shapes on the same screen. We could identify a huge number of different positions. If something moves just a little bit, we can notice it right away. In contrast, we cannot tell colors very easily. Uh, this says, the research says, less than 20. For me, it would be less than four or five. Okay. Uh, again, we're talking about the number of distinct values that could be seen on the same display at the same time. So here we have a nice summary. Here we have 14 encodings on the left side mapped to natural ordering, distinct values, and also the type of data. Okay, this is a handy reference. <coughs> Notice only position and text labeling is suitable for all types of data. Also, even though we're not up to display, uh, displays yet, we're looking at visualizations, since we are talking about position, on a dashboard, position is also considered to be important. Upper left-hand corner or the middle, more important than the upper right or the low, lower left, which is considered to be neutral, and the lower right is considered to be the least important. Now, Professor Storr once asked me, what about the visualization associated with the New York Times? <laughs> okay, it doesn't follow this. Does anyone here know? <laughs> Does anyone here read the New York Times? <laughs> The physical paper? It seems like maybe not. Maybe that's the answer to your question, Ted. The, in, the, in a newspaper, not a, a tabloid, but in a, in a physical newspaper, right? But the paper, the newspaper is organized. Oh, this doesn't work too well. But you have the, uh, the banner up here. And the most important article is not in the upper left-hand corner, but down the right column. That's fairly narrow. Okay. The second most important is down the left column. And then it proceeds from left to right. Usually, column gets larger, but it doesn't go down all the way. And there's usually some image down here or over here somewhere. So that's very different. I'm not sure what the online version of the New York Times looks like, if it looks like this or not, or whether the articles are simply presented separately. But this is not a natural ordering. Right? This is a learned ordering. Okay? There's nothing natural about this. In fact, 
Most people think it was designed for people riding on subways in New York City many decades ago. So people would simply fold their newspaper, read down the right column, they're standing up, holding the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the support in the subway, and when they get finished, they flip it over and read the next column. Let's move to the actual formal structure. There's almost an infinite variety here. We have bar graphs, good for discrete data. We have line graphs for continuous data. We have time series. I've made a listing of these, and I put little arrows here on what's popular in business intelligence displays. Okay. Tables are good when you need precision, when I mean, you're talking about quantitative data. Heat maps and small multiples I would like to show. This comes from the McKinsey report. I just scanned it in. This is a heat map. So you notice that we have various colors here, different levels of intensity. That's the idea of the heat map. Actually, when I was first introduced to a heat map, this was 20 years ago when it was being first deployed and on, on Wall Street, and the heat map was connected to real-time data. And the trading volume would go up or down in a particular category of, of, of equities, you would see the brightness go up or down correspondingly on the graphic in real time. This is a nice little underused visualization. It's a bubble chart, also found in the McKinsey report, so I decided to scan it in. This is good for actually displaying three data dimensions. Okay? So here we have a, long, a dimension on the x-axis, the value of big data. On the y-axis, we have the uh, historical productivity growth, and we have these little bubbles the size of which shows the relative size of the GDP or the contribu contribution of that sector to the GDP of the nation. So we're actually showing three different data dimensions on the same visualization. This one <laughs> is underutilized, and I would recommend this actually for an executive visualization. This was developed by Edward Tufte. He calls it small multiples. I like this a lot based on my experience, okay? And, and what it is is that we're showing something, expenses, sales, really anything, and we're chunking it out somehow by departments as we have here or by regions. It could be anything, okay? And we're showing many of them on the same display to get a high-level level feel so that when someone looks at this thing, they say, oh, look what happened here in August with accounting. There's been a big drop off. What happened? Double click on that, and the diagram explodes. So you can see more details at a lower level. Okay. I think this is nice for an executive type dashboard. Better than the one I'm going to show you, which is considered to be good. <laughs> okay. And we have other kinds of formats for relationships. We have geography. Circular visualizations, you have to be careful about. They seem to be very popular in business intelligence displays, but most uh, computer scientists and mathematicians don't like them too much. They think they take too much room, and they don't save that much. Now, there are two big exceptions. The first is our pie chart, again, provided we're only showing fractions of a whole, and we only have a few fractions and they differ in size. I think we've all seen pie charts where there are dozens upon dozens of teeny little wedges with a legend to the right. That's totally useless. Why would you even want to show that? <laughs> okay. The second one is to show cyclical relationships, particularly in the field of biology. These are very popular in chemistry and biology. So we've all seen this. I hope, if you recall, this is the Krebs cycle, okay? Also notice that when you're showing a circular process or a process, or a circular process, this is a circular process, always show it clockwise. And of course, we could combine these together. We could take a bar chart and superimpose it on a scatter plot. We could take a line 
aircraft and superimpose it. We could have comparisons by using bar charts with different colors, say, or many different lines. We also have another popular, or maybe not that popular, but should be more popular, another idea by Edward Tufte called the spark line. This is shorthand to show a trend. It's a single graphic. It'll show you a trend over time of something, typically money, but could be anything, could be sales. So this is a checking account balance of $137,000. So <laughs> it's not my checking account balance. But, but what they do is they show it over time, and where it ends, they actually display the value. Okay? Again, it's another quick reference. Okay? Now, if you want to see what it was a few months earlier, you would simply put your cursor over that point, and a pop-up box would appear to tell you what that value is. Okay, this is very good of uh, very popular in the financial community. This idea of the spark line, you may actually see it if you log on to your bank accounts. You'll see a spark line. So Tufty comes up with a lot of good ideas on how to make this visualization simple, okay? which is why I like his visualizations. Okay? Now we have the navigation strategies. Okay, so. Here, I'm just listing some of the things we can do, okay? We could compare things, we could add variables, we could zoom in, we could aggregate, filter, meaning we're hiding data. So let's, and we can access details on demand, typically through a drill down, but also pop-up boxes. So let me give you an example. Uh, here we have two broad categories of navigation strategies, direct and exploratory. But I want to show you this Schneiderman. Ben Schneiderman actually is a computer scientist at the University of Maryland, and he specializes in computer-human interaction. Okay? So this is his mantra. Overview first, zoom, filter, and then details on demand. So let's see exactly what he did from his book. We have here dollar sales, and it looks like women's clothes, shirts, pants, skirts, blouses, and dresses. Okay. And on the x-axis, you notice we have weekly sales. Something catches his mind on the left side. Okay. So he surrounds it with his mouse, or somehow he identifies, give me more details on these two weeks of data. Okay. So we expand the x-axis to daily sales. He then wants to hide shirts, pants, and blouses so that only skirts and dresses remain. Now he's found his problem up in the upper left-hand corner, and he puts his cursor there, and a pop-up box appears. Okay. So that whole sequence is what we call OLAP. Okay. Taking a high-level view, or an example of OLAP, taking a high-level view, zeroing in, exploding the axes, eliminating, hiding data, and then revealing more details. Okay? It should happen as fast as I just showed it to you. It often doesn't, because a lot of our OLAP, what are called online analytical processing tools, look like reporting, report writers that have been fixed up to mimic this. To, to mimic this. Okay, so you have a lot of pull-down menus, and you have to go through this to, and it takes you several minutes to do what should take seconds to do. I'll try to show you a Macintosh, uh, an Apple <laughs> uh, example of, of how it should look in a moment, okay? Now let's take a look at the BI dash uh, display. Now this is gonna be the display itself. Okay, so here we're gonna have multiple visualizations in the display, okay? So you notice here we have bar charts, we have tables, we have line charts, okay? And here, our four factors in design are user profiles, task analyses, the configuration of the visualization, and the combination of portal and dashboard. So let's take a look first at the user profile 
and task analysis. In general, we classify users as executives, managers, business analysts, operational workers, and knowledge workers. Okay? Only the executives, analysts, and operational workers are fully supported in the field. Okay? Our research and the research of other people have indicated that knowledge workers are the least served user community. Also, orthogonal to this, we sometimes like to think of users as being either power users or casual users. Okay? That does not refer to their, their domain knowledge, but rather their knowledge of technology. Are they the kind of people who will drill through and analyze the data, or do they, or do they simply want the answers displayed to them right away? Okay? So each of these five categories has their own set of power and casual users, okay? And each requires different kinds of data and visualizations. So here's an example of some functional, some functional analysis associated with uh, continental airlines, for example, when they develop their business intelligence system. Now we also have the idea of a portal versus a, dash, a dashboard. A dashboard has many visualizations on the same screen. Okay. A portal, like a Google portal, takes you to any number of dashboards. Okay. I think we need to be able to use both. Uh, not too many people use the BI portal because they seem to be infected with that Afghanistan bug and they try to put everything into one picture. Okay. Let's take a look at the most common types of dashboards, the executive or strategic dashboard, the analytical dashboard, and the operational dashboard. Okay? The strategic dashboard typically is focused on high-level measures of performance. Typically, they are static snapshots of daily data, weekly data, monthly data. There's little user interaction. You don't want too much here. It's better to be simple. Analytical displays are designed for detailed data analysis. So here we're going to have comparably more data and more complex data with richer comparisons. Okay. You're going to have extensive historical data here. However, it will also be typically snapshots, periodic snapshots. They're going to have a lot of interaction here with a lot of OLAP features. Operational data is designed to monitor operations. This requires a dynamic environment where we are using real-time data or near real-time data, as in, say, monitoring a supply chain management system. Okay. Here we need to keep it simple, like we do with the executive dashboard, but for different reasons. Here we need to see problems right away and then be able to drill on demand so we can locate problems when they arise in real time. Okay. So let's take a look at each of these dashboards. We have the strategic display for an executive. This is a CIO. Now this is considered to be a good <laughs> display. But when I look at this, the CIO doesn't seem to have much on his plate. He has in the upper left-hand corner, which is supposed to be important, uh, we have systems availability. Well, that is important, but if something goes down below a certain threshold, that CIO is going to be notified immediately. He, this person is not going to be looking at a display to find out that some system is down. His phone and his cell phone would be going off the hook. So I don't think it corresponds necessarily to the way the real world actually works. Okay. In the lower upper right hand corner, he has some non-system metrics like expenses year to date and customer satisfaction. He has over here on the right side, he has project milestones with dates that are coming up, okay? He has top projects in the queue and 
critical events meetings over the next few days. Okay. I don't know if you need an executive dashboard to tell you any of this, okay? Uh, but that this is considered to be good. I would replace this with the idea of the small multiples, which I think is more suitable for a CIO. Okay. Now the next one is better. It's an analytical display. This is for a web marketing analysis. Okay, so of course the top, they measure, they're looking at the number of visitors. This is year to date, this is this month, and this is today. Okay, so they're actually drilling down for you and showing you the details immediately. Up here we have referral sites and products. This is pretty interesting because I did this on Wall Street for our stockbrokers or something similar to this. Okay. What we have here are the top 10 products that are purchased this, that are purchased together but displayed separately. Okay. So a lot of analytics goes into that, but that's interesting to know. Products that are purchased together but displayed separately. Over here, we have the opposite. Products that are not purchased together but displayed separate, but displayed together. This is an example of an operational display. Okay? This comes from Continental Airlines. Okay? So again, this is operations with real-time data. And as we can see, uh, there's a flight here that's coming in at gate C37, and it has high-value customers on it. And this flight is 27 minutes late. And there's a certain number of passengers that need to go to gate 29 and gate 24. And here we have 12 minutes for one and 20 minutes for the other. So we need to get their baggage from gate 37 to 29 and to 24 in minutes, okay? So this operational display helps us do that, okay? My own experience for knowledge workers as in stockbrokers on Wall Street, is that they need too much data and they need too much detail to fit it on one picture. Okay. Hence the idea of a portal. And I'm beginning to develop this model that as the data requirements expand, both in breadth and depth, the navigation needs to be pulled up out of the dashboard into a, a portal. And that portal you navigate through the portal, which is exactly what we did, and that will lead you to any number, almost an infinite number of different visualizations and displays. Okay? This is exactly what a knowledge worker needs. Okay? And I have a brief lessons learned. Don't squeeze everything into dashboards. Rethink the executive dashboard. Try to come up with some guidelines for knowledge worker. Uh, intelligence displays as I was just speaking about. We need better OLAP tools, and that report writers in disguise, okay? And it's best to use a handcrafted approach. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>